Welcome to the Nichols Tax Update Podcast, issue number 2105. This program is produced to provide current information about developments in United States tax law. Cases, rulings, IRS pronouncements, and expert comments on hot topics. You are receiving it as a member benefit from the South Carolina Association of CPAs. My commentary is necessarily brief, and you should consult appropriate authority before taking a position on any item discussed in the program. I acknowledge the value of my subscription to Tax Notes Today in preparation of this program. Tax Notes Today, published by tax analysts, is, in my opinion, the preeminent source of information for tax professionals, and I could not prepare this program without tax notes today. Well, what do we got here? Eight items. It was a busy week. Employment tax credit guidance. A farmer's wife cannot deduct losses after seven years of failures, even though she had 6,500 acres to work with. Then there's a new online option for sending authorization forms to the IRS. Everyone should be on top of this because we need it. The employers are urged to claim extended employee retention credits in some circumstances. And an attorney, a native of Nigeria, was not away from home when he worked in Maryland, nor was he away from home when he worked in Minnesota. Uh, apparently, he wasn't away from home in Nigeria either because he didn't really keep very good records of what he was doing where he was. We'll learn more about that. The IRS threatens criminal charges now, folks, for failing to, to, to respond to an administrative summons. There are some, some tax attorneys who have been advising their clients to ignore the administrative summons and wait until things heat up with the IRS, especially those that are giving advice on the tax shelter, uh, the, the conservation easement cases. Those have really gotten out of hand. There's really a lot of, of uh, acrimony between the tax bar and the IRS on these issues. And then a reminder that the IRS might snag your rebate credit to pay a taxpayer's debts, whereas they would not have been able to recover it from the economic impact payment. We'll talk about how that works and what you need to be on guard for. And finally, a cattle farm with no cattle, no deductions. Let's learn about all this this week. Tax Notes Today, an article by Eric Youch. The IRS clarified how businesses can qualify for an employment tax credit even if they also received a coronavirus loan that was not forgiven. On January 22nd, IRS posted guidance on its website, and the title of that guidance is on the slide below, saying that employers who received PPP loans and included wages as part of payroll costs to support having their loans forgiven tax-free but saw their forgiveness denied could claim those expenses, those those uh, the, those employee payments, as employee as qualifying for the employee retention credit. So, you you your claim for forgiveness on the loan was denied. Your support for part of that was wages you paid employees. Now those same wages can form the basis for employee retention credits on your four, in your fourth quarter payroll tax returns this year, right now. Here's the title. It didn't get requested PP loan forgiveness. You can claim the employee retention credit for 2020 on the fourth quarter form 941. It's not too late, right? We should be able to do it now. If you didn't, maybe you need to amend the fourth quarter 941 and claim the credit. Go to www.irs.gov, find this uh, guidance. You should be able to search for it by the title and follow the directions. Failed farming loss. William Bruce Costello's wife was an ambitious uh, woman. She wanted to get texted. Well, she wanted to get have a successful farming operation. They had 6,500 acres in Mexico. She tried raising chickens. That didn't work. Well, she tried raising chickens to sell for meat. That didn't work. She tried converting that to an egg laying operation. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, the land was so poor that a starter herd of three cows. Now, the, the woman bought three cows that were pregnant. They were going to have three calves, and she would keep the calves, and that those three cows would be the foundation 
for her herd on the 6,500 acres. The problem was those three cows on 6,500 acres of land in Mexico could not find enough to eat to keep from starving to death. Gives you some idea, gives you some idea of the quality of the land. It was one failure after another after another. Total revenue from all farming activities over a seven year period was $5,868 and 4,800 of that was from selling the three cows that were in danger of starving to death. <laughs> You can't make this stuff up. This is more fun. Most of the claimed expenses would have been startup costs in any event, and the tax court judge is writing this opinion with a straight face. The husband testified he was hopeful that something would come along that would, that would work and actually be profitable. <laughs> There's nothing to say about that. Oh. Now we can submit Forms 2848 and Forms 8821 online, my brothers and sisters. A new online option will help us remotely obtain signatures from individual clients and submit third-party authorization forms electronically. No touch. The tool can be found on the tax professionals page at www.irs.gov. Again, you must have or create a secure access account before you can submit an online authorization form, but it's not hard. Follow the directions step by step. It's easy. The new online option may be used to withdraw prior authorizations, but it cannot be used for anything else. You can't ask questions. You can't address other issues. It's just for it's just for remote signatures and and posting and withdrawing authorizations. The process to mail or fax authorization forms is still there, you can do that. But signatures on those forms, of course, must be handwritten, which means that you have to submit the form. The form has got to be in front of the client to get their signature or in front of you to get your signature. Eligible employers should claim the refundable tax credit. The Taxpayer Certainty and Disaster Tax Relief Act modified and extended the employee retention credit for six months through June 30th of 2021, retroactive to March 27th, 2020. The law allows employers who receive PPP loans to claim the refundable credit for qualified wages that are not, not treated as payroll costs when obtaining forgiveness of the PPP loan. So you, if your PP loan, PPP loan was less than your total payroll costs, you will be able to claim additional costs for the employee retention credit. Now there's a limit on that. We all, I think we're all familiar with the limits. Eligible employers can claim a refundable tax credit against the employer's share of FICA tax equal to 70% of qualified wages they pay to employees after December 31st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. And a lot of us, a lot of us did our PP loans and did that whole drill in, uh, in 2020 and we still have employees. We're still making payroll in 2021. The qualified wages for this credit are limited to $10,000 per employee per calendar quarter. And there are two quarters in 2021 that are, for which you can claim the credit. Don't, don't lose sight of all of the available credits and deductions and special, and special help that's available to fight the economic burden of the COVID-19. Small employers can even request an advance payment of the credit. Now, I know I'm going to pay some people. I'm going to pay these people. I Don't make me wait and claim the credit. If you give me the money now, I have a better chance of actually surviving and being around into the summer when maybe vaccines will be available and things will finally start to loosen up. Akim Adebayo Soleyede was not away from home, and so he cannot claim travel expenses. His tax home, and he actually had a tax home, was in Maryland, not in Minnesota. Even though he also practiced in Minnesota, an overwhelming percentage of his income and most of his work days were in Maryland. He had no contemporaneous records of time spent, no billing records, etc., the sort of thing that might have supported his claims of where he was actually working. Major expenses disallowed were for lodging in Maryland, 
hotel, and then finally an apartment rental, and travel between the states. Good records of billable time assignable to client matters or time spent working remotely. He, he did contract legal work. He reviewed documents, and he got paid by the hour for doing that. But apparently he was sitting in his apartment in Maryland when he did that work, or he was doing that work for someone in Maryland. Uh, he, he might have got a different result if he just kept records, but he didn't. Code Section 274 requires adequate records or other sufficient evidence to support travel expense. Code Section 162 requires support in some form proving an expense is reasonable and that it's incurred in pursuit of the taxpayer's trade or business. Attorney Soboyede had no such records, and so he lost his claimed expenses. The total was about, it was about $10,000 that he lost. And what really is amazing as we go through these week after week is, is how small some of the amounts are and how, how the issues keep coming again and again and again, how difficult it seems to be for some people to accept the truth of the tax law. It may, maybe, you know, I've been doing this a long time. Maybe it just seems easy to me because I've been doing it a long time. I don't understand why it is so hard for some people to understand that that it is the law. It's printed in English. <laughs> you can read it. Uh, you can you, you can actually get a lot of good information on on the web. Uh, by I don't I don't understand how some of this happens. And before we're through this week, you're going to wonder how it happens too. Criminal charges are possible for ignoring a summons, children. <laughs> you got you get a you get an administrative summons, you gotta respond. Code section 7210 is not used very much, but it's a misdemeanor with a potential sentence of up to a year in prison for any person who, being duly summoned to appear to testify or to appear and produce books, accounts, etc. etc., fails to do so. Not only that, there's circular 230. It, circular 230 Paragraph 10.20 or 10.21 says that you have to promptly respond to requests from the IRS. If you don't, it's an ethical breach. And you get in trouble with OPR. As you get down to the last line on the slide. That's exactly the point I want to make. The interest in more referrals for prosecution under 7210 comes from stories that are going around in the tax bar about a defense strategy in which attorneys for taxpayers that are caught up in the, the uh, conservation contribution scandal are trying to stall, hoping that the statute of limitations will run. It isn't going to happen. It's a dangerous strategy, according to IRS lawyers. And what they're doing is they're referring practitioners who give such advice to the OPR. Now, if the OPR gets one referral, okay, well, it was one incident. But if they get one after another, after another, after another, you're a bad actor and you can expect disciplinary action. That's the promise of the OPR director. Recovery rebate credit may be offset by your debts. The advance payment could not be offset by uh, past due debts, state, state income taxes and that sort of thing. Uh, it, it, but the recovery rebate credit can. And that's because of a glitch in the law, an amendment to the CARES Act in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 states that only advance payments are protected from offset. So the, the advance payment, if you get the advance payment, it's protected by offset. But the IRS says, well, if you didn't get an advance payment, don't worry about it. Just claim the recovery re rebate credit. But wait a minute. The IRS can can claim they, they can hook part of my recovery rebate credit if I have unpaid liabilities of the type and kind that can be offset. IRS says they're going to treat as a deficiency in tax any excess recovery rebate credits claimed on a 2020 tax return, and they will collect non-accepted debts under their math error authority. Now, that's bad news. But the good news is affected taxpayers have 60 days to challenge 
math error corrections. You don't have the same administrative process on math errors that you have on a deficiency notice. On deficiency, you get to, you, you get to file a protest and you get to go through that administrative process. process. That's not available on a math error. But you do have 60 days to ask the IRS to reconsider based on your facts and circumstances, but that's going to involve correspondence and it's going to take time. And if it's your client, they're not going to really be too excited about paying you to go after this. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that, that, that we can do, that the client can do, rights they do have, and, and I have trouble figuring out how to charge them a fair fee for doing it. Maybe you don't, maybe I do because I'm just soft hearted. Uh, it seems that we ought to be able to get some kind of recovery from a, a fund when uh, the, the tax law is producing an unfair result, but I know that's not going to happen. Good banker, bad cattle rancher, <laughs> no cattle. I mean, we've all heard the, we've all heard the phrase, big hat, no cattle. <laughs> this, this is that. Stephen Whatley, a pillar in the community. His family went back 11 generations. His great, great grandfather had farmed a 2000, well, had a 2000 acre plantation where they grew cotton and cattle and vegetables. And, but the family, they went through some hard times and they lost the 2000 acres, but they didn't lose there in Alabama. They didn't lose the family background. So Mr. Whatley, after paying his dues and working here and there, working in another bank, came back to his roots and founded and became the controlling shareholder of a multi-branch community bank. According to his testimony uh, and the testimony of others, he worked 70 hours a week. He was a powerhouse. He was a, a strong personality. He, he brought this bank uh, from nothing and the people trusted him and they gave him their money. But he went about, he visited the branches, he, expected, he inspected his property, he, he, he wrote about his ranch, making notes about things that needed to be done. By the way, he had 170 some odd acres uh, that he was uh, going to turn into a timber and cattle operation. His adjusted gross income for the years under, a, under discussion here varied between 320,000 and a million 470. After Schedule F losses that were between 70,000 and 248,000 dollars a year, the total losses were almost a million 564, representing more than 500,000 dollars in tax because of the tax brackets that those losses protected. The banker, according to the IRS and the tax court agrees, could not offset his banking income with losses from a cattle farm and timber operation because it was clear he did not engage in the activity for profit. All of these years, he never reported any income. And by the way, he had no cattle until he learned he was going to be audited by the IRS. On another note, back when he acquired this land years ago, 10 years ago, he formed an LLC. It was going to be the cattle ranch, but he never transferred the property to the LLC. The LLC borrowed money and he might have claimed an interest deduction for his principal residence, which was also on his property, but the, but the loan, the, the loan was to the LLC and he and his wife owned the property individually. In other words, he never, he didn't take care of the paperwork. He was so busy being a big shot, being a pillar of the community, running his bank, his bank with several branches, making sure he visited every branch at least two weeks, every two weeks, that he forgot to do the simple stuff. By the way, where was his longtime CPA, James Kemp, who is named in this litigation? James, you let your client down. I'll bet this guy is one hell of a strong personality. I'll bet he told you well, what, was, what you were going to do with his tax returns. But James, what about Circular 230? 
What about the AICPA standards? Did it ever occur to you with due diligence, loss after loss after loss? How, how was it documented? Did you ask? Did you see anything? Should you have asked? Circular 230, paragraph 10.34 says, you can accept your client's representations until they don't make sense anymore. Year after year after year? Come on. And we can take a lesson from this. Mr. Kemp, perhaps, could have stood up sooner and said to his client, Mr. Watley, let's be sure that we actually transfer title to the land into the LLC. Mr. Watley, let's be sure that we actually document all these activities are supposed to be, the, 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 Mr. Watley, the court is not going to take your word. You're, you're, not a, you're not a big shot when you get to tax court. But he didn't because he was the longtime CPA. And he let the client run the tax compliance. And that's never a good idea. That's it. Until next time, please stay safe. I will miss you if anything happens to you.